Unless you didn't come up here and help Steve this morning, but kind of thought that was kind of cool last Sunday. But uh, maybe maybe next Sunday we'll get you up there. Uh, Ray Ray is or Raylan is already gone to Children's Church. I would tell her what a great job she did. Can you imagine? Uh, RJ, she's four, three, five. I was close. <laughs> and uh, you know it's amazing how those little minds can remember uh, all those words. But uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord for her. One day there was uh, these six blind men who had decided to go to the zoo, and the guide wanted them to describe one of the exotic animals that they had at the zoo. Of course, they couldn't see it, uh, but they wanted to let them experience and hear uh, the description that each one of them had. So the first blind man reached his hand and grabbed the animal's tail, and he exclaimed that this animal uh, was like a big rope. The next man uh, felt uh, this massive leg, and he said, well, this is no rope. This is a tree. I can feel how big and brown it is. And the third blind man walked forward and ran right into the side of this big beast, and whereupon he pronounced that this animal was really just a big, hairy wall. The fourth the blind man reached out and took one of the uh, elephant's ears and kind of tickled it, and all of a sudden uh, it began to wiggle its large ear. And the fourth man, he exclaimed, why, this animal's just a big fan. The fifth blind man decided the first four was slightly off a little bit and couldn't describe what he felt altogether. But all of a sudden, he, the, the elephant uh, raised its big trunk and the blind man fell to the beast and he said, well, this is a big snake. Finally, the last blind man, totally confused and listening to all these descriptions, but he wanted to find the truth. So all of a sudden he tried to approach the big beast and found one of its great tusks and grabbed a hold of it and went all the way to the end and it was so sharp at the point. This blind man said, I, I just don't understand, but this is just a great weapon, a great sword that could pierce a man through. You see, what those blind individuals could not do is they couldn't see the whole animal. They were only able to sense and feel certain parts, and so therefore they described it. But you see what sight does is it allows us to stand back from something and to be able to see it for what it really is, an elephant, with all of its grandeur and greatness. And so the title of my message to you this morning is, Where You Stand Determines What You See. Where you stand, where you look at an object, will determine what you see. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 73, and I'm going to read the first nine verses out of the Living Bible Translation, and I'll go back to the King James as I minister to you. But I just thought the Living Bible kind of put it in a context that I, I want you to be able to understand this morning. Psalm 73, verses 1 through nine says, how good God is to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I came close to the edge of the cliff. My feet were slipping, and I was almost <coughs> gone. For I was envious of the prosperity of the proud and the wicked. Yes, all through life their road is smooth. They grow sleek and fat. They aren't always in trouble and plagued with problems like everybody else. So their pride sparkles like a jeweled necklace and their clothing is woven of cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff at God and threaten his people. How proudly they speak. They boast against the very heavens and their words strut throughout the earth. This, this was a problem. 
that confronted the writer of this song. You see, he was looking at his situation from the wrong vantage point. And I believe if we'll be honest this morning, we're guilty of the same things. There are times when trouble seems to come our way during the course of, of living our lives. And when this happens, sometimes we begin to look at things very narrowly. And However, there's far more to the picture that is really there than what sometimes our eyes can see. This psalm teaches us really to get our eyes off of our circumstances and to place them squarely upon Jesus Christ. And I hope we can kind of see that uh, this morning. You see, our friend, the writer of this psalm is Asaph. And he was ready uh, to quit. He was ready to throw in the towel and walk away from God. However, we learn to look at things, and we should learn that when we look at things through the human perspective, it's not through the eyes of God. And that's the only way to really look at things when they come to us in life. And I hope that we understand that as we develop this thought this morning. So let me go through just three points here. Number one, what was the foundation of Asaph's education? Verse 1, he says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. So in this very first verse of the psalm, we see that Asaph is standing on solid ground. He believes with all his heart that God is good. He's been taught, he's been educated, that God is a good God. And you and I here this morning, as we've gone through Sunday school, as we've gone through Bible studies, and then we've gone through messages in church, we are taught that God is good. And it teaches us that God can't be anything else but good. Jesus himself testifies of the goodness of his heavenly Father in Matthew chapter 19, verse 17. Jesus says there is none good that is but God. Secondly, Asmuth, like many of us here this morning, have been taught these two great truths. Number one, God blesses his people. Now we know that. We've been taught that. We believe that if we love God and we walk and follow God, that God does bless his people. And that's a true statement. As a matter of fact, Psalms 84, 11 says this, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will be withheld from them that walk uprightly. So the Bible even uh, encourages us to that fact. That God blesses his people that walk uprightly. And then the second thing that we're taught is that God blesses the pure, the pure at heart. There is another true statement. But be careful that we're not too cynical of another brother and sister that might be going through some hard times. Saying, well, they must be into some kind of sin or these bad things wouldn't happen to them. Now, I know we're all innocent and have never said that in the congregation this morning. But I just want to warn you, in case that thought might enter into your mind, when another brother and sister, things aren't going that well when it seems like things are harder on them than it is you. When circumstances begin to come about in their life over and over again, it's easy for us holy and self-righteous and pure and upright individuals to cast a little judgment upon them, right? Say amen, Amen. amen. So, so here again, we're taught these things that God blesses his people and that God blesses the pure. But, again, be careful because if somebody is going through something that doesn't seem like a blessing, you don't know the whole story because you're not looking at the right perspective. You're not seeing that brother or sister from the eyes of God. So be careful. Number two, what Asaph has experienced in his life. You see, 
our experiences have everything to do with how we think, how we operate, how we live, how we walk. Look at, get at verse 2. But as for me, my feet, this is Asaph confessing, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. So, you know, he's looking, saying, listen, what's going on here, God? Why are these folks out there that are not upright, that are not righteous, that are not worshiping you, they're not praising. How come it seems their life is so good? How it seems like they're in prosperity? Well, I remember forgetting watching the Godfather series. And, you know, it's easy when you first begin to see the, the story of the Godfather. I mean, he lives in a mansion. They drive around in beautiful cars. They have all the nice clothes. They get to travel. They get to have plenty of money all over the place. But I'm going to tell you something. You keep on watching the movie. And life's not that good. Huh? Life's not that good for them. He walks out of his business. And all of a sudden these gunmen shoot him down. Right in the street like a dog. His son stops at a pay booth and they come out with machine guns and practically cut him in half. You know, folks, I don't know about you, but I, I, I would rather be able to just kind of, you know, go through life and drive my 03 Chevy pickup truck and, you know, live over there in the subdivision that I live in. And folks, I, I walk out and I don't have to worry about having uh, the gates uh, barred and gunmen standing there because somebody wants to kill me. Well, well I'm sure somebody might want to kill me, but at least I'm not, uh, I'm not out there worried about it too much. So in this section of the Psalms, the point is, is Asaph is, is standing on, you might want to say, slippery ground. Uh, again, let's, verse 2. He says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. You know, I, I almost slipped. What he's talking about, I, I almost walked away from God. You know, he, the problem he said is, is the same problem we fought from time to time. Life isn't always filled with sunshine. Storms come, folks. Now, not as many as we're getting here lately, but, you know, sometimes we misinterpret the goodness of God. We often think that if we're good, that should always translate into blessings. Well, why not ask Job about that logic of thinking? Amen. You know, was he wrong? Was he in sin? Was he doing so wrong when he was up on the mountain uh, uh, giving sacrifices for his children just in case they hadn't done what they ought to do? Was he wrong when all of a sudden he began to get the reports coming back in that, that Job, you've lost something else. Job, you've lost something else. Job, you've lost something else. But Job made a statement that has always stuck to me that always helps me get balance when bad things happen in my life. And, and when all of these things happen, when Job seemingly lost everything in his life that was good, he said this, Naked, I came into this world. And naked, I shall go out. And then he said this, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You see, folks, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter the storm. It, do, it doesn't matter. Because if you're looking at the perspective of God, when you're looking on the mountain and you're able to see the whole thing, then you will understand that all of these things have a reason and they have a purpose in the kingdom of God. You may not understand them. You may not understand them or get an answer. That's another misnomer we have. We somehow always believe that God owes us an explanation. You know, God, why did this happen? 
God, why is this taking place in my life right now? You know, God, I just got through a storm. You know, how come another one is coming my way? And we get angry, we get mad, and we're like, Asa, listen, I'm about ready to throw in the towel. I'm about ready to give up. It's kind of like when your children, you know, throw those tantrums. You know, they start, especially when they do it in public and they embarrass you. <laughs> I've told you this before. It was through the mentality of demons that in the grocery store, the checkout line is so narrow, and they put candy and gum on either side. Amen? Amen. That's, that's demonic right there. Because your children, it's all almost within reach. Uh, you know, whether they're in the buggy or not, they've designed it that way. And they put all of it right there where they can see it. Oh, Mommy, can I have this? Daddy, can I have that? I just want one. Or can I have this? Of course, my daughter, she was the negotiator. She'd say, well, can I have three of those? No, you can't have three. Okay, can I have one? You're, you say, whoa, 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 just a minute. I didn't say one. So, so you see, that's the way we get sometimes with God. But, but Joe summed it up. Listen, I had nothing when I came into this world, and it's for sure I will leave with nothing. Re remember, there's no you all. It's following the hearse, right? So, so you can't take it with you. And, and, and so Joe understood that God is still God no matter what. Now, let's notice something else about Asa. He, he was confused about what he saw because of the perspective. So number one, let me give you what he saw. By the prosperity of the sinner. Verse 3 again, he says, For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It bothered, it bothered Asaph that wicked prospered while some children of God did without. It bothers me sometimes. I'll, I'll admit, you know, I, uh, some of these people, uh, I, I was reading an article, and I won't mention her name, but she's a famous Hollywood elite. But she paid over a million and a half dollars. She was overseas. To have these certain beverages flown to her. Th th this plane had to stop several places because she wanted several beverages and food items. And it cost her over a million and a half dollars to have those items flown, picked up, and then flown to her overseas where she was on set. A million and a half dollars for some beverages, her favorites, and some food. And I was thinking, Lord, my church could use a million dollars. Why would you bless her? like that so she would waste that money on stupid stuff. Huh? Have you ever been there? You ever look at something like that and wonder, what in the world? I mean, you know, I remember, listen, I had to quit watching the lifestyles of the rich and famous. <laughs> well, they, that's what Asaph is saying. Listen, listen, I see that. I was envious. And God had upset me. It upset him in the most part. Secondly, by the peace of the sinner. Verse 4, for there are no bands in their deaths, but their strength is firm. In other words, there are no divisions, there are no breaking down. There, there's no seemingly uh, problems that they're having. It seems like they're in peace all the time. Uh, and, and he was upset. He watched the wicked live their lives in slim, sin and slip off into eternity seemingly, in his eyes, see, from his perspective, with no problems. These folks have it so good. He goes on, verse 5, and they're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. So he saw the pleasure. You know, these rich and wealthy people, you know, they jet off to here, they, they jet off to there, they that they, they pay twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to spend the night at some luxurious resort in, in the Bahamas. They they hire a private jet. 
Some of them own their own private jets, and they jet them all over the place so they can have a weekend get together, you know, spending a half a million dollars. And, and I have to save for months to afford a $132 a night room at St. Augustine. And I get upset. I said, God, that's not fair. Chuck got to, I mean, Charles got to go into the holies of holies of my neighborhood. Guy with the Austin Martins and the BMWs. I was envious of Charles. <laughs> he got to look at him. I have to peer from across the road, you know. And then he, he, he gets into the pride of the sinner. Verse 6 through 11. Uh, Asaph goes into a whole rant there. He says, therefore pride compresses them without a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. In other words, bad things just don't bother them. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than a heart could wish for. And yet they're corrupt and they speak wickedly. You know, God, listen to these people. Turn them into dust. Take lightning and blow them away. And then, verse 12 and 6, he, he goes on with his rant. He says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world, and they increase in riches. Verily, I, I cleanse my heart in vain. In other words, what? Asaph is saying, Listen, I'm trying to live a pure life. I'm trying to live a holy life. I'm trying to live a, you know, like God wants me to. I, I'm going to church. I, I pay my tithes. And, and, and I, I, <coughs> I teach a Sunday school class. And, and here's my wealthy person or that person. Kind of seems like nothing ever goes wrong with them. Well, Naturally, thinking like that always results in disaster because, folks, you're not standing on the right mountaintop. You don't see the whole picture. But mostly, mostly, you don't see everything. Excuse me. <coughs> Still have a little residual uh, cold that brother uh, <laughs> window game. <laughs> Let's look at what he said the calendar. Beginning verse 17 though, you'll notice a change. And I like that. Verse 17 says, until I until until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. You, you see, Asaph moves from the slippery ground of human perspective. And he steps squarely into the shouting ground of the heavenly perspective. <coughs> What's he doing? He says, listen, I went to church. I had a bad attitude. I wasn't seeing things clearly. I was looking at them rather than looking at God. Amen. I was judging myself based on how they were living, the ungodly, rather than looking at how God sees me. And folks, ultimately, Asaph realized that there were a couple things that he learned when he went into the temple of God, when he went to church. Number one, the future of the sinner. That, that will bring you back to reality every time. When you realize the future of the sinner. Verse 17 through 20. Let me look at verse 18 with you. It says, Surely thou dost set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down unto destruction. How are they brought into destruction? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terror. In other words, listen. Wealthy people are always worry about not being wealthy. That's right. When you have millions and millions and billions and billions of dollars, you're always worried about being able to keep it, to be able to sustain it, to be able to have all that stuff to keep it, to hoard it. How many people?
that have won the lottery and got millions of dollars that their lives didn't end up in ruin. I mean, the families got greedy and hated them and resented them because they didn't give everything they had to them. How many people did, did not end up wishing that they had never bought that ticket because it brought their lives to ruin? It's easy to look and say, man, I wish I had a million dollars. But you know what? Maybe you'd be wishing the wrong thing. Because if that million dollars brought you away from God, if it took you away from living a godly life, if it took you from walking away and walking in the sin, folks, it wouldn't be worth it, would it? What would it gain a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? Nothing! He'd end up in hell. And then that brings to the second thing that he learned was the foolishness of self. He said, verse 21, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my uh, reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Asaph confesses the fact that he had been looking at everything through a faulty set of selfish lenses. And when he dealt with the bad, he dealt with his own heart. And he walked away looking at things rightly. Because he discovered some things, and I'll close with this. First of all, he knows the blessings that we as followers, as believers, have. Number one, and money can't buy this, by the way, all the wealth in the world, all the riches, all the fame, all the popularity can't get you what I'm going to share with you in these next three things. Number one, the presence of God. He said in verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. Asaph realized that even in the midst of his trials, he was never alone. Even in the midst of the storm, God did not go for higher ground. He knew that God would guide him and lead him and bring him to his heavenly home. The second thing he realized in verse 24 was the protection of God. The presence of God and then the protection of God. He said, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Asaph realized that, that even though the storms of life may range all around us, that these storms are under the control and direction of God. I don't know about you folks, but that's comforting to me. It's comforting to me to know that God is in control. I know we say that a lot, but you've got to get to a place in your life to where you find comfort and peace when you're going through a storm. Knowing that God controls the matter of the storm, God controls the rage of the storm, and He controls the length and the time of the storm. You see, because God knows you. And then, number three, is the perception of God. He says in verse 27, For lo, they are far from thee, shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all of them that go whoring from thee. But it is a good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, that I may declare all his works. You see, Asaph came to a place that he understood that those old boys that were enjoying this season, one day they will be called into account. For all of those that rejected God, for all those that had turned their back upon God, they were living the life now, but the life that they were going to live in eternity wasn't going to be the same. Wasn't going to be the same. For the child of God, yes, he may have to suffer. He may not be able to live in a mansion here on this earth. But it's for sure that the Bible says that he has prepared a place for you. And the great carpenter 
named Jesus could create this world in all of its beauty. That could create the universe and the stars and the planets in all their majesty. Can you just imagine what bungalow God has created for you in heaven? It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, <coughs> we come before you this morning. Lord, we, we bow our hearts before you and we, we confess, Lord, that yes, sometimes we, we don't look from the perspective that we ought to look from. It's easy, God, to get our eyes caught upon people and circumstances that, Father, rightly so, I mean, we, we look at the lifestyle of the wealthy and the famous. Oh, yeah, from one perspective, God, it, it looks like they're just enjoying the, the life. You know, everything's good. Everything's going their way. They have anything they seemingly want. But if we look at it from another perspective, those people that don't know Jesus Christ are going to die and go to hell. That's not worth it to me. And I know that's not worth it to you. In our flesh, we might be a little envious. But I pray that every one of us this morning, in our spirit, we realize that what God offers us, yes, here on this earth, yes, here on this earth, it is good because God is good. But even though storms come and trials come, God ultimately, when this life is over, they will be suffering in unthinkable anguish and pain where we will be in the presence of God forever and ever and ever. So Lord, help us when our feet get slipping, when we begin to look at individuals from the wrong perspective, God, let us, let us see beyond the, the here and now. Let us look at what awaits all of us in the future. Now, Father, bless your people here today. I know that many are suffering. I know that many hearts are heavy. It's because we don't know. We can't see two seconds in the future. But thanks be to God, you do. And you hold every second in your hand. And so God, I pray that the peace that goes beyond you in understanding will be upon hearts and lives that are here this morning. That God, that you will comfort and give peace because you are a miracle working God. Now, Father, if there be any here today 